All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, once again, great to see everybody here. We appreciate uh, everybody taking time out of their busy schedule to come on over and uh, spend a little bit of time uh, learning a little bit more about our Catholic faith, learning a little bit more about what it means to be Catholic. And uh, of course, the most important part of this is that by doing that, we're growing closer to Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Um, last week, we uh, kind of finished up on part three, if you have your syllabus, part three of uh, kind of generically, yes, that wasn't jabbing at you, Kelly, but yeah. Um, generically talking about uh, those things that are normally associated with being Catholic. Uh, and so we've, we've talked about a different, a uh, couple of different things. But there was uh, a couple of bits of information I wanted to, to give you for the coming week and uh, things that I want you to think about. So in uh, two weeks, on uh, Saturday, October 16th, at uh, 12 noon, <coughs> on the square, uh, we are going to uh, say the rosary. And it's, uh, I want to say this is either the fourth or fifth Remind year, names again. Uh, fourth or fifth year that we, uh, we have done uh -huh. this. Okay. So if you find yourself uh, free, uh, say at 11.45 or something like that, uh, come on down to downtown, the courtyard, I mean the courthouse square. And on the steps of the old courthouse there, uh, we will say uh, the rosary. And we will say it in uh, English and in Spanish, because I'm totally fluent in Spanish. <laughs> I can say some of the prayers in Spanish. But I was wondering if you have to memorize them in both. Yeah, yes. Is that the text for that, tonight? That, that, that memorizing be a, both? That's right. <laughs> oh, and you forgot <coughs> that one, too. You have that in one class. Um, so put that down on your calendar because October is the month of the Rosary. And so uh, not only are we doing it because it's October for the month of the Rosary, we're also doing it because uh, I think today in history uh, was uh, something called the, the Battle of Lepanto, which was the Ottoman Turks were pushing westward, invading Western Europe uh, in the, I can't remember what century it was, I just lost it there. But anyways, um, so the West put a hodgepodge of uh, sailing vessels together to push back against the Ottoman Turks. And this was basically to save Western civilization uh, at that time. So the Pope, and I think it was King Philip of Spain was in charge of it. And they put together kind of this <coughs> mighty crew of uh, ships and sailed east to protect, I think it was to protect Cyprus. They were just starting to come into Western Europe, Cyprus, Greece, like that. And the uh, Ottoman Turks had a formidable navy, very huge navy, uh, very <coughs> modern at the time, and of course the West didn't have anything. So the Pope said, I want everybody to pray the rosary. And what happened was, out sailed this motley crew of ships to meet the Ottoman Turk Navy. The weather turned terrible and pushed the Ottoman Turks back away. And it was a victory for, uh, for the church, for Western civilization, and it stopped Islam from moving into the West. So that's another reason why we do that in October as well. Um, the other question I think we had is, as you can tell, we've been, uh, you know, doing these videos. And I think we had said at the, in the first uh, class, but maybe we weren't uh, clear enough. We have a website called Be Catholic. You see it on the shirt. You see it up over there on our banner. And it was uh, something that Andy and I started so that we could reach more people uh, if they were just interested in being Catholic or learning more about being Catholic or wanted to know how to <coughs> complete their sacraments, all those kind of things. Uh, and so we've been putting these up on the website. And so the website is called Be Catholic, 
one word, and it doesn't have to be capitalized or not. Be Catholic dot life. Be Catholic dot life. So you can go on there and um, <coughs> if you wanted to see previous classes because you just love sitting through them so much, you just wanted to experience the joy once again, of, especially my wife, she would be very happy to watch those things over and over again. Um, or if you missed uh, a point, you came in late, or you weren't here for that class, that's a great way. Also, what we've been doing is before class, we've been doing little five minute snippets on something Catholic, I call it the Deacon Corner or whatever. Uh, and that's posted up there too. So I've done something on the rosary, something on the crucifix, two things on the crucifix, uh, one thing on making the sign of the cross. So just those little kind of things. Uh, good for kids to watch, you know, little kids. Uh, promise their G-rate. So I mentioned the library too. Yeah. Oh yeah. And uh, we've also, um, over here to your right, my stage left, uh, Andy has put together a little uh, library, an RCIA library. And uh, a lot of these are donated books, but they, they <coughs> cover just some uh, basic uh, topics, different areas of uh, interest. <coughs> at any time, uh, you're welcome to come on over and take a look at them. Uh, you can take them out, take them home, read them. We just appreciate at some point, bring them back, okay? Or leave the $500. <coughs> <coughs> The last thing I wanted to go on over is everything that we're doing uh, all of this time uh, comes, can be found in something called the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Do you have trouble sleeping at night? Crack this baby open, you'll be asleep in about 10 seconds. Uh, it's really, you know, thick. It's written kind of like a law book because it's kind of written in high theology, but it does contain all the things that we are going to talk about all this year. And uh, the word catechism means to echo or to repeat back faithfully. So remember we were talking about those three things that so we said sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church. Sacred tradition, you pass on what you have heard, like an echo, perfectly passed on. This is, um, <coughs> this is some deep reading. So I uh, would recommend that instead of, <coughs> instead of getting that book, I would get this book. Look, look how much thinner it is, <laughs> right? This is called the Compendium of the Catholic Church. A uh, compendium, rather, of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And it contains everything that's in here, except it's in question and answer format, nice and easy. It's got some um, nice artwork in here, and then in the back it also has your prayers, uh, the most common prayers in English and in Latin. So. Um, and you want to pass, we pass that around. I'll just get that back when we're done. If you just want to take a look at it, you can probably get it on Amazon or one of those places. But I really recommend it uh, now that we're going to start getting into things like the creed, uh, so on and so forth. Okay? All right. Uh, the last bit of information I wanted to pass on to you, um, I think is really uh, important for all of us to hear, and that is, uh, you remember Tammy, who, um, the older woman that sits over here, mm -hmm. who uh, was uh, kind enough to share with us that she was having a medical procedure done and that she would be gone for a while. And even before that, we had said, hey, pray for one another, pray for everybody in here. And then when she shared that with us, we all prayed. Well, she wrote, I tried getting a hold of her last week I could not get a hold of her. Her um, mailbox was full, and uh, she reached out to me a couple of days later and gave me some news, and it's, it's unbelievably good news. And that is, um, she went in for a procedure on her lung, and it had some, um, something to do with her heart as well, if I remember correctly. And she shared with me that the doctors thought that it was 
cancer and they thought they might have to remove up to 20% of one of her lungs. Uh, we prayed, and I know I prayed uh, all week for her. Uh, that doesn't mean anything. Like I don't have any extra powers, but I'm saying just keeping holding somebody in prayer is an important thing. And she wrote, and I received this uh, a couple of days ago, and it sounds like A, it, they didn't have to take 20% of her lung. It sounds like they took uh, less than, uh, right around 5%. What they took out uh, was not cancerous. She was free of cancer. Wow. She said she was breathing normally that same day. So, uh, again, right there, it's the power of prayer. So don't forget to pray for everybody that's here. You can always say, you know, I don't know their names and I don't know what they need, but you do, and you know what they need. And so I just lift, I just lift up everyone here in prayer. And Scripture tells us that the fervent prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Prayer, I have found, at least uh, in my life, if I pray for myself, that's okay. That's kind of like that love we talked about. I love me. Oh, great. Where does that love benefit? It doesn't really benefit anybody. God wants you to pray for yourself, certainly. But when you pray for somebody else, it, it's amazingly much more powerful. Because now you're doing that agape love thing. Now you're praying for somebody. You're not going to get anything back out of it. But you're praying for the best. You're willing the good for that person. And you can see how that that can oftentimes turn out because God honors those kind of prayers. Okay, isn't that good news? Mm -hmm. great news. Yeah. So, um, I will ask her at some point in time if I can get a hold of her, if I can put her letter on our website, and uh, you guys can go on there and read the whole thing. But it, it was I was so happy. I was. Uh, I'm, it's amazing to see that happen. So, since we're talking about prayer, let's get started then. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, we give you thanks always and everywhere for your great <clears throat> glory and your kindness and mercy to us. We thank you especially for the positive outcome uh, for Tammy, and we hope that she will be able to return to us here in just a few weeks, and she'll be able to tell us uh, how wonderful you have been to her. We ask also, uh, you know the needs of everyone here, and we ask uh, that you hear those needs, and if you can meet them, uh, meet them in the way that is best for those uh, who are praying. We ask now that you send your Holy Spirit to be with us, help us, and guide us as we continue our study of uh, the Catholic Church and the Catholic <coughs> faith. Help us to grow in knowledge and love of you. And we ask this in your most holy name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, last week, like I said, we finished up with what is Catholicism? By no means did we cover everything. Uh, so with these three classes, I can't say, oh, yep, you're Catholic now. You know everything you need to know. You just know enough to get yourself in trouble now in an argument, probably. Uh, we're going to uh, move on, and uh, we're going to start now with uh, the creed. The creed is what we believe as Catholics and as Christians. The creed is one of the four pillars of our faith. And you'll see when you look at your syllabus that it's actually broken down along those uh, the lines of the four pillars. The first pillar is the creed. The second uh, pillar, and it's not it can be in any order, uh, is the seven sacraments. Uh, 
The one for prayer life is, uh, I just like to call it the Our Father. And uh, I just drew a blank. I don't know why I do it. Oh, yeah. Who could forget that one? Right? <clears throat> the Ten Commandments. So these are the four pillars upon which our faith rests. The creed, seven sacraments, our prayer life is summarized in uh, the Lord's Prayer, which as Catholics would call the Our Father, and the Ten Commandments. The funny thing about Catholics and prayer is uh, everything we do has a name, but as Catholics we call, we call the prayer by the first words in the prayer. So the Lord's Prayer is called the our Father. Why? First two words. Our Father who art in heaven, right? The prayer to Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace. The glorious, the glory be. The glory be to the Father and to the Son. Uh, you'll see that happens a lot. It's kind of Catholic shorthand. Uh, so <coughs> the Lord's Prayer is the Our Father or uh, Latin Pater Noster. The Pater Noster. Remember, uh, well, you'll see if you didn't look, last week I talked about the rosary uh, in that little five-minute Be Catholic Deacon's Corner. And uh, for a while there, the rosary was called the Pater Noster because uh, the people wanted to pray like the monks prayed or priests or brothers that were in monasteries. And they were using beads or string tied in knots so that they could pray all 150 psalms every day while they worked. They would, or during the week, they would say all 150 psalms. Well, <clears throat> most people back then, uh, you know, were working people. They didn't really know how to read and write. So they couldn't really read the psalms. They couldn't do that. But one thing they could do was memorize. And so, as good Catholics, they had the Pater Noster memorized. So, instead of saying 150 Psalms, they would say 150 Our Fathers. And they would use the beads to count. And so that's why it was known as the Pater Noster for a while. So, that's your little Catholic trivia for the week. All right. <coughs> so, uh, this is, this is really what makes us Christian. This is what makes us Catholic, all of these things. So we're going to start off uh, with what we call the creed. Now, the creed is uh, basically a baptismal symbol, the word symbol, or not holding it up and saying, hey, look at this, or ching, 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 this kind of symbol. It is a... Um, it's something that contains the mystery of our faith. And just as I told you before, the creed was something that you had to learn before you could be baptized as a Catholic when the Catholic Church first started forming. Because as most of us think now, almost everybody we know that's Catholic, when were they baptized? when they were babies, right? So obviously they didn't learn the, the creed at that point, but they were going to go through um, all of their, uh, their training. But back in the first century, in second century, the people that were becoming members of the Catholic Church were all adults, or almost all adults. So the way that they would be ready uh, to be welcomed into the church was through baptism and in order to be baptized they had to be able to say what it is that they were going to do. What did they believe in? Why were they getting baptized? <coughs> and so we came up with something called the creed. Now there's two forms of the, the creed and we're going to look at them now. The first one is called the Apostles Creed. I'm sure you've heard of that, right? 
The second one is called the Nicene Creed. And I'll explain, I'll explain to you the difference there. So as I said, as people were coming into the church, this was basically the last thing that they gave, they gave them. You've been following people around, you've been learning, you've been seeing how uh, people worship. You've been going through a, a process of catechesis. Remember the catechism of the Catholic Church? You were being formed in what to believe so that you could repeat it back faithfully. Right? Because again, most people couldn't read and write back then. I mean, they could, they could understand uh, if they went to the marketplace or something, they knew how to count and they could do basic reading, but uh, first of all, books were extremely expensive back then, obviously. Second of all, uh, probably couldn't read the Latin uh, the way it was written. And so the first uh, thing we want to know about the creed is that it's been around basically since the time of the apostles. And so the first creed that we learn, the one that we actually say when we say the rosary, is called the Apostles' Creed. And we'll look at it here in a second. The Apostles' Creed is the older statement of the two baptismal statements. The second one, the Nicene Creed, that is a, um, shall we say, a refinement of the Apostles' Creed <coughs> And it first uh, came about in, uh, let's say, 325 A.D. At the first council of Nicaea, that's why that was the name of the city in which it was held. That's why it's called the Nicene Creed. It was updated <coughs> shortly thereafter in the year 381. AD, and we'll talk about that. So the one that we know now, that we say at Mass uh, every Sunday, is the one that pretty much was completed in the year 381. <coughs> so we've been saying that we believe the same things for 1,700 years, okay? And this statement uh, isn't just Catholic. This is what Christians believe, all right? But specifically, uh, Christianity through the Catholic Church. All right, so um, if you will open your mass missalettes, that's one of the best places to find it. If you go to page 110, right after the... Uh, the priest or the deacon give a homily, right? You see them, they go back to the chair, and we sit down, and we contemplate. Wow, that was an awesome, awesome homily, Deacon Ed. Wow. <laughs> that was so awesome. And after that, we stand back up, and we start into the profession of faith. And we say, I believe, right? Well, guess what? That word is in Latin. Credo. Credo is the first word. Remember I told you about our Father, Hail Mary, right? So what is this one called? It's called the Credo because I start off with I believe. That's where we get the, the uh, English word creed from. And you've heard it uh, before, that word creed. For instance, when we talk about, say, like the Fair Housing Act or some kind of law, and it says that you cannot be discriminated uh, based on race, color, creed, right? You hear creed, right? So creed means your statement of beliefs, what you believe in. <coughs> so. Uh, the Apostles' Creed, the older of the two, is the shorter of the two. Uh, and you will see that, uh, that I, think, I think it's in there as well. By the way, let's talk about this. This is just, this comes out as you come, you come into 
to church, you have the ushers and they hand this to you, right? So this is called the missalette. It just means a small missile. Not, boom, not that kind of missile, right? But, um, what you see up on the altar, that big red book that Father uses, that's called a missile. Again, coming from a Latin word. Um, this is the missalette, meaning each one of you got a smaller version of it to sit out here. This contains the whole mass, all the different uh, readings, all the different things uh, that you will need to go for mass, and it has a period of time on there. So this one will go from went from August 1st to November 27th. Well, what's November 27th? Well, it's the last day in ordinary, last Sunday in ordinary time. The next Sunday, we start into Advent, Christmas, we're heading into Christmas, right? So that's how they kind of get broken up. And we'll talk about ordinary time and all that at another point. But that's why we, uh, I brought this over here to you because uh, it'll be easier for you to read through it. The Apostles' Creed is 112. And 112, thank you. <coughs> so we can go back and forth and look, but it, like, like Terry was saying, look at page 112, and you see it takes up half a page. Look at page 110. Just a little longer. Right? <clears throat> the reason for that is when the Apostles' Creed came out, um, it was the baptismal statement for all Christians as they first <coughs> came into the church, as I said. But remember I told you in the history of the church, almost immediately, people started getting things wrong. Remember we talked about telephone, right? Well, people immediately started getting things wrong um, as far as what certain things were supposed to be or what they weren't supposed to be. And uh, the church was trying to figure out, basically, what the Holy Spirit wanted everybody to know as far as believing uh, as Catholics. But when people started purposely making other choices than what the church was telling them what to believe, that is called a heresy. And you've heard of that before, right? Person's a heretic. Burn him at the stake, right? Heretic. Well, heresy simply means, um, technically speaking, uh, as far as theology goes, it's a post baptismal choice to believe something that the church does not say is correct. Post baptismal. Before that, you're not baptized, you can make all the kind of mistakes you want. But if I tell you, for instance, that Jesus Christ is true God and true man, and you say, no, 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 I believe he's God, but he really wasn't a man. And I go, no, the church teaches through the Holy Spirit, through the bishops, and through the faithful, in other words, the lived experience the lived faith of the laity all of those combined to keep the church going in the correct direction so if you say no no uh, I don't I don't believe that's correct then we say okay if you don't believe that that's fine but you're not Catholic <clears throat> you're something else but you're not Catholic so that's what a heresy is it's a decision. It comes from the Greek word to choose. So if you choose not to believe what the church teaches, then you are bound by your conscience to leave the church. Catholicism is probably the only religion, certainly the only Christian religion in which we say, you have free will. We're gonna tell you what to believe not because we're large and in charge, but because the Holy Spirit has guided the church through two millennia. 
This is what the Holy Spirit wants you to know about God to a greater or lesser <clears throat> extent. Some of these things are minor things, but those things that we say are must know, which we call dogma, the dogma of the church, such as God is one, one God, three persons. That's dogma. If you don't believe that, that's fine, but you're not Catholic. So, um, the, the Apostles' Creed almost immediately started uh, generating, but what about this, or what about that? So, when they had the second uh, meeting of uh, council, and it was called the uh, Nicene Constantinople, was the second place was in Constantinople, Constantine, right? You've heard of Emperor Constantine? In 381, that's why it got much longer, because it was already answering some of the heresies that had popped up. And the most important heresy that had popped up is something called Arianism. You might have heard of it later on, like the Germans talk about the Aryan race, right? It's not really connected to that, but it kind of, in a really skewed up <coughs> way, they're still talking about Arianism. This was named after a bishop. His name was Bishop Arius. And Bishop Arius did not believe that Jesus Christ was truly a man. <clears throat> now, I'm not saying, man, oh, that guy, he was evil. Remember what I said? These guys were wrestling. There was no manual for them to look at back then. They were the guys writing the manual. These are the guys that put together the catechism. And they would go back and forth in the council saying, well, what do we believe about Jesus? Well, we believe he's God. Okay. Well, how can he be God and be man? And so they had to wrestle with that. And one of the things also that came out of this council here was, um, what's, what was the role of Mary? Was Mary really the mother of God? Well, if she was the mother of Jesus, everybody agreed with that. Back to square one. But what was Jesus? Was <coughs> Jesus God? Yes. Well, then Mary was the mother of God. No, she can't be the mother of God, right? They wrestled back and forth, back and forth with that, and the church said, if she is the mother of Jesus, she is the mother of God. Right? That's one of those mysteries we talked about. So, um, when we look at the Nicene Creed, you're going to see some of those more specific things in there than uh, you will see in the Apostles' Creed. And so, uh, first thing that we, we read is, I believe in, and here it says one God, but the updated version is, I believe in God, right? But we said, how many gods are there? One. So here we go, the very first sentence, I believe, notice this is a statement that you are making personally. Uh, Several of us are old enough to remember when this was translated after Vatican II, they translated, they changed it from I believe to we believe. That's what I have. Right. We believe in one God. And that was a creedal statement of the church, right? We're all part of the mystical body. So when we were saying we believe, we were saying we, each individual Catholic, believe. <clears throat> but that was not how it was written in Latin. So... Uh, they went back and made, made it uh, more specific. And the way it had originally been written in Latin was, I believe. Why? Because it was a baptismal statement. The whole church wasn't being baptized. People were being baptized. So we start off with, I believe in one God. The Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. 
And that's probably as far as we'll get today. That's how much stuff is in that one statement. So first of all, we said <coughs> I. That's important. Never forget that when you're in mass and you say this or you read it, you're owning it. Okay, and again, cradle Catholics, half the time we're up there, and I believe in the God Father, <laughs> the creator, and we could say it backward and forward, right? And the brain's disengaged at that point. So I challenge you, if you are one of those <clears throat> people, like me, um, like you, or you have a question. No, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you're talking about I, mm -hmm. and in every mass that I've been to, when uh, Father gets up and he, he he starts, I believe, and then we all come in. Right. But we're all supposed to say I? Correct. And now, okay. Yep. What's it say there, Kelly? Well, that's what it says. <laughs> but we're, he always starts it off, and right. then we. He says, I believe. Right. He's kind of doing, he's like the band leader, right? I believe. Well, that's, oh, that's our cue. We jump on in. Right? That's kind of how the penitential act comes in, too. Right. Says, I, and then we all right. Says. I believe. We start off with those very important two words. Our Father, Hail Mary, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so first thing you want to know is that we're starting off with that word I. So from now on, when you're at Mass, even if it's just Father that says, I believe, I want you to say, I believe. Okay. Yep. And what is the second word? Believe. What are we talking about when we say believe? <clears throat> Credo. Yep. What what word that starts with an F? Faith. Faith. Okay? That's what we're saying right there. Because when you say I believe, you're engaging faith. Remember I said faith is a gift <clears throat> from God. But first comes the grace. God then prompts you to respond. He doesn't take your free will away, but he helps you respond. And when you respond, you are responding by faith. So I, just you, believe there's the evidence that you're engaging your faith right there, that you're trusting in God, you're saying from this point on, I believe. You wouldn't have to go any farther, really. You're saying, yes, God, I believe. So I believe in one God. <clears throat> We talked about what God is, right? God is from everlasting to everlasting. God has no beginning. God has no end. God is. I'm going to say that again. God is. Not God was or God will be. God is. So I believe in God, the Father, We've already started to break that thing down. So right there, we're saying that we believe in God. We know who God is. <coughs> we're already saying he's Father. Now we're saying, the next word we're saying is that he is almighty. Almighty. What does almighty mean? All powerful. It means all powerful. But what does that mean? He's the strongest person on the block. He got the biggest muscles. What does almighty mean? The word is omnipotent. And this is the first characteristic when we talk about God. God is omnipotent. The word omni means all. 
and you have that word potent. When something is potent, it means it's very strong, right? So strength. So almighty means all strength, all power. He's all powerful. What does all powerful mean? Well, it means that he has the power over everything that is. He is has the power uh, to make it, to hold it in being, to change it, to do whatever he wants to do. So he is omnipotent. There's another word that describes him. Omni is in there again. Well, I'm going to go for the second hardest word first. Omniscient. This all falls under <coughs> almighty. If you're almighty, that means you're all powerful. Omniscient. What word do you see in there? Science. Knowledge. Knowledge, right? Science, right? So all knowledge, all knowing. So God is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is knowledge itself. He is wisdom itself. Even scripture says, basically, gird your loins, where were you, you know, when I put this all together? He's talking to Job. Where were you? Can you tell me? There's other uh, scriptural uh, passages that say, who was his counselor? Who instructed God? Well, if we go back to those five proofs, if somebody instructed God, he couldn't be God, right? We'd have to go back farther. So God is all knowledge. Everything that is known is known by God. And the last thing, and you all said it, was omnipresent. Omnipresent. All all present. Present everywhere. <clears throat> Always. How is that possible? How can God be here with me <clears throat> and be on the other side of the world with somebody else at the exact same time? Because he's God. <laughs> because he's God, right? First of all, right? Absolutely, right? If he is almighty, there's not anything that he's not capable of doing that's part of his description. Now, I'm putting a little caveat there, and you'll see why in a second. So how can he be present everywhere at the <clears throat> same time? Yes, sir? Because we're all in him. We're all in him. Okay. That would be a partially correct. I, I see what you're trying to get at. Right. That God is in us. Right? Right. Right. Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. But that still means each one of us all around the world at the same time. So how can he be present in you but be present in somebody else in Japan at the same time right now? That is all present, right? He's present everywhere now. How can that happen? Well, yes, he's God. Yes, now you got the other word. It's a mystery. That's another way we get away with it, right? It's Catholics. Well, well, how do you explain this? I can't. It's a mystery. I just do what they tell me, right? I want you to think of it this way. Because God's name Let me see if I spell it right. Yahweh. Yahweh. This is in Hebrew. Y H W H. When we translate that, it means I am that am. I am that am. Well, thanks, Deacon Ed. That makes it so much clearer for me. <laughs> 
This, by the way, is called the, the tetragrammaton. There's a big word for you. Tetra in Greek means four. Grammaton means letters, the four letters. Hebrew doesn't have vowels. So the way it's written in Hebrew comes out as Y-H-W-H, and we get that word Yahweh, Yahweh, right? Actually, the word Jehovah is a German derivation of Yahweh, and I'll show you that in a second. It's not really super important, but it's kind of that one of those trivia things. So God is telling us when he tells, when Moses is up there and in, and in his good New Jersey accent says, you know, not for nothing, but you're going to send me back down and talk to the boys, right? So i got to kind of tell them who you are. So who are you? What's your name again? And God says, my name is I am that am. Oh, that helped. Thank you. I'll be, I'll be right back. <laughs> and down he goes, right? Um, so how can that be, right? Well, I want you to think of it this way. First of all, who made time? God. How do we know he made time? Because he's almighty. He can make time, right? So God is the maker of time. Is God bound by time? So when he made time, time is a, like a rule, like gravity, right? Or light. It's one of those things. God made, but just because he made it doesn't mean he's bound by it. So God created time, and if we look mm -hmm. at his name, he says his name basically is I, I am. Think about that. He's <clears throat> all present, and he tells us that because he says I am, not I was not I will be, he says I am. So if I put that in a sentence for you, God says I am in your past. I am in your present. I am in your future. Why? Because you're bound by time. You have a past, a present, and a future. But God's not bound by time. He's the maker of time. He is the definition of time. So when he says, I am, he is present. Always present. Present in your past, present in your future, present in your present. And he's also that in everybody else. Why? Because he is all am. I am being is what he's saying. I am the essence of being. I be everywhere. Not I was and I will be. I be right now. Because right now is what God is. Right now. Oh my gosh. Really? You know what? Being Catholic's hard. This is so hard. But I want that's why we're going to go through this. I want you to think, because there, there are basically 12 creedal statements in this creed. And the very first one is, I believe in God. And you could do a whole month on just, I believe in God. So all-powerful, almighty means that he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and he's all present. How do we know that? Because he told us. He said, I am that am. He is existence. So, I believe in God, the Father, we explained that last week, creator of heaven and earth. The Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I want to just, we'll finish with this word.
create. <clears throat> God says that he is the creator. My wife is a super cook, and when she goes home, she creates some really great dishes. But wait, did she really create those dishes? So you better say yes. <laughs> no, she made those dishes, but did she create them? Did she go like this? Let me think about it. There's a tomato. Well, she created the recipe. Did she? Why? Well, look at the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm getting at is that the act of creation that comes from being almighty means to make some thing from from no thing, from nothing. That's what to create means. So when we say that God is creator of heaven and earth, and we'll talk about heaven and earth next week, we'll use a little pickup from there. But we're saying that God is so powerful knows everything and is pre is is right we had bill clinton say that famously one time it depends on what the word is is right yeah. but here as catholics we know what the word is is isness being that's god anything that exists exists because of god and stays held in existence because God holds it in existence. You know, they have that old saying, God stopped thinking about you for one second. You disappear, right? Because God holds us, knowing holds us all in existence. So God made something from nothing. Now, I don't want to beat you up on this word, but I want you to think about what that means. From no thing, there was no thing. There was nothing but God. Nothing else <clears throat> had existence but God. And God was such perfect existence that he didn't need anything else than himself. But because we said also God is love, we said so love is all about giving, that's how God started to make something. But what did he make it from? There was nothing else but him. Right? We can say, well, I just picked up some dirt and I added some water. I got these mud cakes, right? There was no dirt, there was no water. There weren't any atoms. There was no, there was no thing. So God, in his knowledge and power, thought it into being by saying it, right? Of course, that's how we as humans have to understand it. But when God spoke the word, it came into being. spoke the word it came into being do we have somebody that we know of that's called the word the living word there's the guy up on the cross right there the second person of the trinity is the word of God right so we'll talk about that later have you ever heard of the big bang theory not the thing on TV <clears throat> the Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory actually uh, was created by a Catholic priest. He was a Jesuit priest. Uh, his name is Father George Lemaitre.
George Lemaitre. Kind of funny, the name Lemaitre means the master. <laughs> so Father George Lemaitre was the one that, using mathematics, figured that watching how the stars moved and all the math and science that's been involved in all humanity having observed what's going on, they kind of played it in reverse. And it all comes back to one point when all things were first created. And they say all of all of creation was probably the size of a grain of sand. Infinitely, almost infinitely heavy, dense, you know, everything that ever was was in a little point, right? But one nanosecond before that, what was it? It was no thing. So even the scientists all can agree that it comes back to this one point. And then as a scientist, which just means knowledge, meaning what I can see, hear, see, smell, taste, and feel, that's science. But science cannot say, hey, look, there's love. Oh, look, there's justice. Oh, look, there's honor. You can't, right? So we have higher sciences for that. We think physical science is the height of knowledge. It's actually the easiest one because you can touch it or feel it or measure it. That's easy enough to say, well, see, there it is. But when I say explain love, well, everybody knows love exists, but you can't measure it, right? You can't pick it up and go, there it is. There's love. So the scientists all agree that it went back to one point. And everything that exists, everything, space, time, light, gravity, atoms, everything, starts at that one point. The Big Bang, right? It's not, it wasn't really a bang, but it burst forth into being. But you ask the scientists, what was it one nanosecond before that? They can't tell you. Why? Because now you can't hear, see, smell, taste, or feel it. But God tells us that he created it all from no thing. He thought it, set it into being, and it was. When you read in the Bible, you open the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. In the beginning, <coughs> God made the heavens and the earth, right? He says it in the Bible, I believe it. But this, all by itself, should be enough to, to prove to you that God exists. Because even the scientists, and I'm talking about Albert Einstein, even Albert Einstein wrestled with the Big Bang and initially said, yeah, it can't be right. But when he finally came up with that very elegant formula, E equals MC squared. And he looked at it, and he realized E equals MC squared is the Big Bang. Then he said, OK. And he and Father Lemaitre became pretty good friends from that point on. But most people don't know that the Big Bang Theory was done by a Catholic priest. So that'll prove to you right there that just because you say you believe in God doesn't mean that you deny science. In fact, as Catholics, we do the exact opposite. We support science. We support all these things. Why? Because the more I know, about what God has made, the more I learn about God. They're not at opposites. They are complementary. 
That's why the Catholic Church started um, almost all the universities in Western Europe, all the hospitals, all of the science that we know, including, remember, Galileo? Already got locked up. The Catholic Church is going to burn him at the stake. No, they weren't going to burn him at the stake. They told him, look, we need to figure this out. You're saying that the Earth revolves around the sun? Well, that's stupid. All you got to do is look outside. You can see the sun is moving. We're not moving. It's the sun that's moving. Come on. Whoops. The church at that point said, wow, okay, we never thought about that because you guys had been telling us up to this point that the earth was the center of the galaxy. And so we told everybody that that's what you said, but now you're saying something completely different. Hold on, we don't want to confuse people. Let's make sure this new theory is, in fact, right. That's what happened to Galileo. Because he said, well, no, I'm, I'm not waiting. I'm putting it on out. And the Pope said, well, wait, we paid for you to do this study. We're the people that paid you to find this out. Hold on for a second. Let us talk about it. Nope, I'm going to publish it anyways. All right. Put him up in his room, tell him he gets no supper tonight. <laughs> That's basically what happened. He was on house arrest. So making something, all things, from no thing. Only God can do that. Now, my wife's pretty good, but when she makes supper, she made it from something. Right, dear? <clears throat> Creator of heaven and earth. We'll start with heaven and earth uh, next week. So, as you can see, when you look at your syllabus, you'll see why it takes so many weeks to just basically go over this creedal statement. Because I guarantee you, at the end of this, once we're done going through this statement, and you start saying it at mass, you're going to start looking at it in a completely different way. Instead of doing that, yeah, I believe in God. You say, no, I believe in God who created everything. Why? Because he's Father. He's Almighty. And I know what that means. Now you'll know every word that you're saying. And that's what's important here. Okay? Any questions? I always like to say any questions. And I always like how people just sit there like. <laughs> One question. Yes, ma'am. I've been thinking about the um, missile and the, you know, the mini missile. Missilette. <laughs> Missilette. Mm -hmm. I noticed that on here it does say ordinary time and it's got 2021 mm -hmm. on there. So is this on kind of a cycle that repeats at a certain level? It does. Okay. So or, around well, the world. Yeah, uh, yes. This is the same. And why would it be the Catholic? same all around the world? Because it's Catholic. Right. It's universal, the same everywhere. So this is a cyclical thing. It's not something that. Yes. The Pope and, and everyone sits down and says, okay, this is what the lesson is. Nope, we're on a cycle, and again, we'll talk about that at another time, um, not to confuse people, but yes, the, the um, Sunday Masses are on a three-year cycle, cycle A, cycle B, and cycle C. Got it. The weekday Masses are on uh, a cycle one or cycle two, so it's only two cycles for the weekday. And ordinary time doesn't mean well, everything else is extraordinary, and this is just ordinary. Ordinary just means number. Like ordo is the Latin word for number. So when the person up front says, welcome to St. George Catholic Church. Today is the 27th Sunday in ordinary time. We're saying, well, no, duh. You just told me it was the 27th Sunday in ordinary time, in numbered time. Because right? we really only have yeah. ordinary time, Advent, and then oh, Christmas, and Lent, and Easter. So if you're not in Advent, if you're not in Lent, you're in ordinary time. 
And then you got colors to go with that too. <laughs> <laughs> I know Easter's purple. I can't wait to wear purple. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk about all that when we get to the mass. You know, thinking about colors and numbers and stuff. That's great, but when we're talking about making something from nothing, that's kind of like the big picture where we get down to the details a little bit later. But good question, very good question. And um, don't be afraid to ask uh, questions. You can ask offline if, if you feel like, hey, I don't want to ask in front of everybody. But I guarantee you that if you have a question about what we're talking about or a related topic, guarantee you're not the only one sitting there. In fact, everybody's probably saying, man, I'm glad he asked that question. I, was, I didn't want to. I didn't want people to think I was, you know, not, not smart. But actually, that old saying, the only dumb question is no the one you didn't ask, right? So if you have a question, and by the way, I, I won't make up an answer. If, if, you ask, if you ask me something, I'll go, you know what? Um, I think it's this, but I'm not sure, so let me find the answer for you. Except if it's with Kelly, then I just make up it. <laughs> okay? All right. Let's go ahead and end in prayer then. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord, we have learned tonight that as God, you hold all things in being, you made all things, and you exist outside of of all that you have made but you are in everything that you made because you are love help us now as we go through the week to contemplate how you as God almighty still want to be associated with each and every one of us in a very personal way so help us to be mindful of that. Help us to honor who you are by what we do and say uh, in our daily lives. Forgive us when we fall short and strengthen us throughout the week. In a very special way, we lift up all the prayers of all the people here tonight. We give you thanks once again for um, Tammy and hopefully for her recovery. Uh, and now we'll take a moment and allow everyone to lift up their, their own prayers. Hear the prayers of your faithful Lord and answer them in accordance with your will. And we ask this in your most holy name. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Class is ended. Go in peace. Thanks. Thanks.